All right, well, th thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you, Dr. Ford, and the community for you know, giving me the opportunity to tell you about some of the things that we're doing. So the title of my talk is Eco-Oncology. And I'm going to touch on three things. I'm going to talk a little bit about ecology, a little bit about complex adaptive systems, and then about how we can take those two concepts and put them into cancer therapeutics and sort of the stuff that we're doing in my lab to address that issue. Whoops, I should have done that. So my journey um, actually is a, a bit of an odd one because I'm not a cancer biologist, I'm a neural stem cell biologist, and my lab's been studying neural stem cells since the early 1990s. But my journey into this area I'm going to talk about actually starts with this girl right here. So her name is Muna, and um, I was at the University of Queensland in Australia prior to coming to the University of Florida, and this was maybe about seven, eight years ago. Um, first week on the job, my lab's empty, my people from Australia haven't come yet. I'm you know, typing a grant that didn't get funded on my computer, and this girl knocks on my door. She introduces herself, says her name's Muna. She saw an article in the newspaper that I studied brain cancer stem cells, and she had these nanoparticles that she wanted to use to target the brain cancer stem cells. And I look at her and I go, how old are you? She goes, well, I'm 15. And I say, first of all, what are you doing at the university at 15? And number two, where do you get your nanoparticles from? And she goes, well, I make my own nanoparticles because I've been working at the Nano Institute for the last year or two. And it was true, she had been working there. So both her parents are professors at the university. Her father's an ecologist. We become buddies, and I realize that we actually have the same job. So he, you know, I study cancer cells that proliferate. I study, you know, whether they survive. I look at pathways, stuff like that. He looks at populations, uh, wildlife populations. He looks at birth rates and death rates. He looks at predators like, um, you know, that are killing the population. He looks at the health of the population. And I do the same thing. So I'm looking at birth rates of tumor cells. I'm looking at predators like chemotherapy and radiation. And I look at the health of the cells by looking at what pathways are turned on. I start going to parties at his house, and I hang out with his other ecology buddies and they start complaining about Bob's paper in the, in the Journal of Ecology. So Bob sends 10 volunteers out here and listens to bird chirps, sends 10 volunteers 500 miles away, and they listen to bird chirps, and they interpret that so many birds are migrating and doing this and that. And at the party, they go, well, that's not true because of blah, blah, blah. And I realize that's another similarity we have, because we do the same thing in cancer biology. Someone publishes a paper, and we argue that the the outcome of that paper, the interpretation of that data isn't correct because we think it means something else. But that's where the similarity between our two jobs ended. And what the ecologists have done is they've been, come, been able to come up with processes or algorithms to find ways to manage populations of animals and to manage pest populations, whereas we as cancer biologists have not done a great job at doing that. So, Maybe about I don't know, six, seven years ago, um, his name's Madden Oli. Madden and I sat down and we said, you know, what if I, as quote, an oncologist, start to think like an ecologist? Could I get better outcomes? And so that was just the, you know, a really simple question of where we started. Now, I had four observations, because remember, I'm a neural stem cell guy going into the cancer world, so I'm pretty naive to that whole world. And so, number one has to do with the modest gains that we've had in cancer outcomes. And so you can see the graph on the left is, you know, you look at this, this is the overall survival rate. It's increasing. We are making a difference. We're not making a big difference, though, and the difference tends to be incremental. Uh, the other graph, if you look at the... Um, now, this is deaths per 100,000 in the United States, looking at heart disease, looking at cancer, looking at stroke. And if you look at heart disease and stroke over a 55-year time period, we've actually caused a 60 to 70 percent reduction in deaths per 100,000. We've actually made a real difference. But if you look at cancer overall, there's been a 5 percent decrease. So I would argue, based on that data, that we have actually haven't done a good job. You know, in 1971, Nixon signed the Cancer Act. Since that time, the USA alone has spent over $90 billion on cancer research. We're not talking the rest of the planet, we're not talking all the pharma companies, all the biotech companies and the effort they've put in. And what we have to show for it overall is a 5% change. So, 
here's a study that was done, a couple studies done in the 1980s. And the bottom line to this is they looked at what was the contribution of chemotherapy to cure of cancer. And what they found is it was less than 5%. And the contribution of chemotherapy to increasing life expectancy by two years was less than 10%. So the gist was of, of this paper, this is a quote from the paper, is that the majority of patients exposed to chemotherapy will have most of the side effects, but they will get minimal benefit from it. And then a decade or two later, another paper came out, again, looking at the contribution of chemotherapy to five-year survival in adult cancers. And what they concluded was that there was about a 2% increase in Australia, a 2% increase in the United States. And then this was a review in, in what's called a journal called Cochrane Reviews, which is a, you know, a fairly um, conventional um, journal that looks at a whole bunch of studies and then comes out in an article. And they were looking at chemotherapy and colon cancer. And the bottom line to it was, in the article, it said, put bluntly, over 90% of the treatments of chemotherapy for colon cancer is futile or unnecessary. It's good for a small percentage, but for most of the people, it's actually not helping at all. And today what we're doing, though, is we're moving away from just general cytotoxic therapies to kill everything. I'm moving towards targeted therapies. And you'll probably see a lot of this in the media. Personalized medicine is, is another sort of buzzword. And what this article is basically saying was that, you know, this, these personalized treatments, they do work well for that small portion of people, but they're getting rolled out to everyone. So it might be good for that 20%, but they're going to roll it out to the entire population, again, diluting the overall effect of that treatment. But yet, any negative side effects will be experienced by everyone. And then here's a paper I found a couple of years ago, and it raises this issue. When we look at five-year survival statistics, what does that actually mean? And so we would assume that if five-year survival statistics are getting better, our treatments are getting better. And what this paper concluded from the data that they looked at was that the five-year survival statistics had little to do with the actual cancer mortality. What it had to do was with better diagnostics. And so the gist to it is if you were to identify a cancer, as your, as your methods to identify the cancer get better and more sensitive, if you identify the cancer earlier, your five-year survival statistics will turn out higher. And so let's just take a, you know, a bit of a crazy example. Most of us probably have some cancer cells floating around in our body. It doesn't mean we're going to develop that cancer, because it may not go on to form a tumor, or our immune systems may end up fighting it. But let's say I have a sensitive enough assay that I can find that one cancer cell in you. So now I go out and I screen everyone, and everyone has cancer. Well, our five-year survival statistics will skyrocket, right? It'll be off the chart. It has nothing to do with the treatment. It had everything to do with the way we're diagnosing it. So what this tells me, you know, again, not being a cancer biologist, is that except for a few notable exceptions, and there are some very notable exceptions where we've made a huge difference in cancer treatments based on chemotherapy, but that the contribution of chemotherapy to cancer outcomes is actually fairly small. Um, cancer treatments are, you know, a hundred billion dollar a year business. About a quarter of that is chemotherapy. And what we're doing is we're taking that same approach and doing it again and again and again and again. And what we have to show for it is a 5% increase over 55 years. And that just reminds me of the definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and just expecting it'll be different if I can repeat it one more time. And the last observation really came from my ecology friend when he started introducing me to this field. And the one thing the ecologists have learned from giving toxic compounds in the 40s, 50s, and the 1960s is that applications of, co of toxic compounds to eliminate a pest population um, always leads to bad, or virtually always leads to bad outcomes. So when we put this together, we think about you know, the eco part, we think of the oncology part, and so, what is the eco part? Kind of where does this come from? So, first of all, what is ecology? Well, it's a study of an interaction among, between organisms, and it's a study of organisms and their environment. This is big business, so I wasn't aware of you know, how much work goes into studying pest populations, studying the environment, and why it's important. But the estimated annual impact of pests globally is $1.4 trillion. It's 5% of the global GDP. This is big business. A lot of people are thinking about this, and a lot of people are implementing effective solutions to some of these problems. 
So when it comes to eradication programs, because if you have a pest, you'd go, well, I want to eradicate it. Let me just get rid of it, right? It kind of makes sense to do that. The problem is, is there's very few success stories in eradicating pest populations in the ecology world. Now, there are some factors that contribute to the success of those eradication programs, and these are things like early detection, if the pest stays in sort of the same population and doesn't move, if the pest population isn't able to adapt to whatever sort of therapy, and if the population doesn't reproduce very quickly, if it's really slow reproducing, you have a better chance at eliminating it. So one can draw an analogy between a cancer population and a pest population. So if you think about a pest population, you may have a billion pests running around in some defined space. You think of a tumor the size of your pinky, the size of your thumb, you literally have a billion cells running around in that defined space. There's no top-down management. Each cell or each agent is acting individually, just like that pest population of a billion of them running around in a certain space. So now what I'm going to say are all going to be um, referring to when eradications do not work when. Now, all of these terms come from the ecology world. But think about this in the oncology world when I make these statements. So, eradication programs do not work getting rid of a pest when you get late detection. Same for tumors. The later you, you identify the tumor, um, the, the, the reduce the probability that you're going to get rid of it. When it's heterogeneous or when it's genetically diverse, when there's a high reproduction rate, so this is one of the classic ways of grading tumors, is how many cells are actually dividing. More dividing cells reduce probability of effectively treating it. When it moves to new locations, or for the cancer, when it metastasizes, when cancer metastasizes, it is almost universally fatal. And the last is when it develops resistance. So when that pest develops resistance, eradication programs don't work. It's the same thing for cancers as well. So we have this analogy between the ecology world and between the oncology world. And so what have the ecologists done to deal with this problem? What they've done is they've come up with something called insecticide-resistant management and integrated pest management. And the approach here really is to understand why resistance develops and to stop that from developing in the pest population. And so there's basically three general strategies to that. The first is called management by moderation. And basically, this means is you limit the selection pressure you put on your population. And so this is just basic evolution biology. The stronger the selection pressure, the quicker your population will evolve. The lower the selection pressure, the slower that population will evolve. The second is called management by saturation. And this doesn't mean saturating with a whole bunch of a really toxic compound, but rather it means saturating the pest's ability to adapt. So as that, let's say, pest population starts to adapt to whatever selection pressure, if you can then identify what that is and block that pathway off, then you have a better chance at eliminating or at controlling that pest population. And the last is management by multiple attack. And, and this kind of comes, these all kind of intertwine a little bit, but basically it's saying you're better to use several small stressors that are below that threshold of actually provide, of inducing um, resistance or of having it adapt to it. Use several at the same time as opposed to one, and again, you get a better outcome. So this is basically in the 1960s. This was all put together in a handbook called Integrative Pest Management. So today, anywhere on the planet, if you have a pest population, you pull out the handbook of Integrated Pest Management, and you do your best to follow those guiding principles. And the goal, however, here is not to eliminate the pest. The goal is to allow the pest to survive, but allow it to survive at a level that's economically viable. So, yeah, I, I can lose 10% of my crop and every year, and that's economically viable for me, but if I lose 80% of my crop, that's not going to work. So how can I keep the pest there but so that it's not eating up all of my profits at the end of the year? So basically, what I've learned from the ecology community is that it's about control, not eradication. It's about administrating non-toxic reagents. It's about intelligent application of toxic reagents, not that we have to not use toxic reagents, we have to use them sparingly. And the key is never, ever, ever allow resistance to develop. It has to be a goal. So now I want to just touch a little bit on complex adaptive systems. And you'll 
see why this will sort of play a role in a bit. So what are complex adaptive systems? Well, this is something that came out of the Santa Fe Institute in the 1980s. And it was founded by a really eclectic group of scientists that include mathematicians, biologists, physicists. And they were all working together, had some interaction through the Los Alamos laboratories. And where it really came from is that they were starting to notice in their experiments data coming out that they couldn't explain with the current models that existed today. So, you know, they went to their academic departments, they went to the journals, they went to the granting agencies and said, hey, give us some money to study this. And largely, they were just poo-pooed. And the reason was they were wanting to do something that was so kind of out of the box and a system that is really set up to do incremental discoveries incremental science, that what they did is they basically said, you know what, we're just going to start our own, our own, basically, our own institute, we're going to start our whole new area of study, we're going to start a whole new field. And so the field they started was called complexity. And really, that is the science of when you have single elements, or a single agent, a single cell, a single pest, You put a whole bunch of those together, you allow them to interact, you give them some time to interact, what they do is they actually form a complex network or they form a complex society. They actually even develop an intelligence to them. So basically, it's when you have simple things acting in simple ways, they can develop into very complex societies or outcomes. So where do you find complex adaptive systems? You find them everywhere. So, for instance, you'll find them insect colonies will form complex adaptive systems, and ant colony is probably a perfect example of that. Um, the global economy, as a matter of fact, uh, Citicorp was one of the early investors in the Santa Fe Institute because the CEO at the time was frustrated that they couldn't predict outcomes in the market. And so he thought, look, if this is a complex adaptive type system, maybe if we understand it, maybe we can get better at predicting that, and it's questionable if they've gotten any better at doing that. Um, fish schools, birds do the same thing. The brain, the immune system, uh, the stock market is a complex adaptive system. And things like, social, like the internet, Facebook, Twitter, are things that are thought to be developing into these complex adaptive systems as well. So, what about cancer? Um, can cancer be considered a complex adaptive system? So there are certain features, there are probably like half a dozen key features of a complex adaptive system. One is that they're decentralized, so control is dispersed, and it's no top-down management, basically. So in a complex adaptive system, there's not someone at the top saying, do this, do that. Rather, the control is spread out between all of the members of it. And so one can look at an individual tumor as being like an individual agent, and again, there's no top-down management system in a cancer. No one's you know, giving directions on what to do. Each individual tumor cell is making its own decision. A second feature is a thing called emergence. And basically, this is the way that patterns develop in a complex adaptive system. I don't know if anyone's ever seen, have you ever seen the starlings that do this? Um, <coughs> Great, and where you really see it is in the fall in Rome. So as the starlings, they all come through Rome, and you'll see them form these unbelievable patterns. You know, again, there, there's, you know, there's no leader telling everyone what to do. They, you know, for various survival reasons, they're, they're moving this flock, but they move as a whole, as a cohesive whole, and it's actually just gorgeous. So emergence is basically when you take a whole bunch of, you know, individual agents, you put them in an environment, you allow them to interact, they emerge in these complex sort of ways. And so you go to a tumor. Well, you know what? Tumors are highly adaptive. They adapt to changing situations, like when you give them chemotherapy, you give them radiation, they adapt to that. And this emergence, though, is, a directly, is directly correlated to them being able to communicate with each other. Which then brings us to the other feature of complex adaptive systems is connectivity. And so this is, to me, this is probably one of the key elements, and I'll show you some data we have on messing with communications in tumor cells and the outcomes that it can have. But the idea is that emergence can't occur unless you're talking to your neighbor and the two of you are communicating so you're knowing what's going on. And so one thing that we do know from cancer, you know, in cancer field is that we know tumor cells do talk to one another, and we know tumor cells talk to their environment as well. So communication is going on within that population. 
Another feature of a complex adaptive system is what's called simple rules. So even though it's called a complex adaptive system, they actually obey very simple rules. And so for a tumor cell, it's, it's the same thing. Even though there's a lot going on within a tumor cell, a tumor cell only does three things. It, well, four things, I guess. It can divide, it can migrate, it can die, or it can do nothing. So it actually has a very limited repertoire of behaviors. And there's a thing called chaotic iterations. And this sometimes gets referred to as the butterfly effect. And in essence, what it's saying is that you, when you start here, a small change here, so let's say you start here and go in that direction, or you start a little bit over here, you end up going in that direction. So that small change at the beginning can lead to a huge outcome at the end. And so do tumor cells do this? And so I would argue that sort of, you know, we can take a group of 100 people that all have the same tumor, we can treat them all with the same drug, and we can get diversely different outcomes in that population. And so I'd argue that that is an example of these chaotic iterations, because each one of those tumors in those people are starting at a slightly different time point. Each one is genetically a little bit different, so those small little changes can actually lead to very divergent outcomes. And this is something we see in the lab all the time, you know. So we'll take a tumor from a patient's brain, We'll grow it up in a tissue culture dish. I'll then take from one tissue culture dish, right? So those cells are about as identical as you're going to get. I'll transplant it into 10 different animals and just let the tumor grow, not treat it or anything. And I'll get divergently different growth rates in that. And I, you know, I always question, like, why am I getting those differences? Well, it probably has to do with one animal got injected with a million cells, and the other animal got 900,000, or, yeah, 900,000 cells, and another animal got 1.1 million cells. So those slight differences, um, make a huge difference when it basically comes to the outcome of it. And the last is this idea called co-evolution. And it's basically the gist to this is that we have this mutualism that exists in biology, and it's that we are adapting to our environment, and our environment is adapting basically to us. A um, perfect example, which is kind of noted here, are flowers and pollinating insects and birds, and basically how those two populations have co-evolved to benefit each other. And it's well established, though, that tumors over time change. And so the tumor you have on day one and the tumor you have on day 100, they're actually very different beasts. And it's because as that tumor is evolving over time, as we give it chemotherapy, it evolves in a different way. So tumors are changing. Um, no, your tumor is not the same post-chemotherapy if it didn't get rid of it as it was pre-chemotherapy. So here is a um, picture of an anthill. And it just looks like a blob, right? Um, but you look inside it, and you find that it has a lot of structure to it. And this structure is done by these, these individual agents, these individual ants. Again, they have a limited repertoire of behaviors. Right? They don't know to do very many different things. But those individual elements create this incredibly complex and robust society. And then when I look at a tumor, so this is a high-grade glioma, that great big white spot there, um, just looks like a blob. But when you take it and you section it, you can see that there's actually order to that blob. And we use that order that we see as part of the way we diagnose these tumors. And who's responsible for producing that order, who's responsible for producing that blob, are the individual tumor cells. So there's, a, again, an analogy to be made between tumor biology and pest biology. So complex adaptive systems, they basically live absolutely everywhere. And the key is that whenever you take a bunch of single agents, you allow them to communicate, you give them some time, they form these complex adaptive systems. So now, how can we implement some of these principles I've talked about, ecology, complex adaptive systems, and you know, can we use this to try to get better outcomes in cancer treatment? So one of the projects we've been working on is adaptive therapy. And I'll go through this fairly quickly, but, and I won't go through sort of the technical details of our model, but basically what we do is we take tumor cells from a patient right from the surgical suite, we implant it into an animal, it grows, and then we're able to treat um, that tumor cell. So this is a project we started a while ago. This is an idea that actually wasn't our idea. This came from Robert Gattenby at Moffitt, and we were just kind of feeding off his idea. And I'm just going to go through it really quickly. The gist of the idea is that your tumor population is actually adapting to the chemotherapy. 
So what if you were to say, and again, this is taking a, taking a principle from, from ecology, is if I give a high dose of chemotherapy, let's say I have 100 cells, and I give a high dose of chemotherapy, and maybe 70 of those cells are sensitive to the chemotherapy, and I wipe them out, those 30 cells that are not sensitive or are insensitive to chemotherapy, they can now have the ability to proliferate like crazy because they don't have any competition for resources anymore. So that population proliferates. I keep giving the chemotherapy, and it's not effective because I've selected for that resistant population. So what Robert Gattenby wanted to do, and he developed a mathematical model for this, is to say, what if I give chemotherapy and, I, and my tumor, let's say, as my tumor shrinks, I reduce the chemotherapy? Because that resistant population, or sorry, that sensitive population, I don't want to get rid of it. I want it to always be there. And as my tumor starts to grow, I'll increase my chemotherapy. And what he showed was that you could actually try to keep a tumor population at bay. So rather than your tumor population growing like that, it would grow like this, and then it would go down and down, and over time, maybe you could manage it and keep it stable by modulating the dose of chemotherapy. So we did this in some animals. We basically put a tumor in the side of an animal, we treated it as the tumor got bigger, we gave it more chemotherapy as the tumor was stable or got smaller, we gave it less chemotherapy. And what we found was that not only um, well, first of all, animals live longer when we gave this adaptive protocol. Um, and tumors are, you know, this is just looking at the average um, age that these animals survive to. We also found that the amount of drug that we gave to the animals, oh, I think that's my next slide, sorry. So we also found if we just look at tumor progression, we can see that with the adapt, you know, this is the untreated tumor, this is the tumor treated with chemo, this is the tumor treated with the adaptive therapy. The tumors grow a lot slower. Progression is significantly slowed down. The other thing we saw is the animals are healthier. So if you were to look at the animals getting the chemotherapy, they looked horrible. Look at the animals getting the adaptive therapy, they look great. They look just like the healthy um, animals did. And this is body weight, which is a really um, strong indicator of health in rodents. And you can see that with uh, animals getting the chemotherapy, their body weight's going down, they're not doing well. But the animals getting the adaptive therapy, they're gaining weight, they're, they're viable, they're very healthy. Eventually, the, tum you know, the tumor eventually did take off, it wasn't a cure, um, but the animals were very healthy and they lived longer. Um, and the other thing that was uh, is that we also give less of the drug, which was kind of um, to be expected. So, number one, not only is it cheaper because you use less drug, not only does the animal stay healthier, but the animal also survives longer when you do it. And the other thing that we've looked at is we've been able to look at the, um, what about um, tumor cells that are resistant? What if we were to then treat them with a second line of chemotherapy and use the adaptive therapy protocol? And what we find when we do that is and so these are, cell, these are brain tumor cells. They are resistant to this. This is the standard of care drug called TMZ or telozolomide. Um, these animals don't care they're getting chemotherapy. The tumor does not care whatsoever. Treat it with what is called a salvage or second-line chemotherapy. It definitely helps. But if we do the adaptive therapy protocol, we get um, an even greater enhancement in the life expectancy of those animals. So that's one way, adaptive therapy is, you know, and all we're doing here is we're just adapting. We're not like coming up with a new drug, we're just saying here's a, just a different way of delivering the drug, and we may get better outcomes, and we may also increase the health of the, of the, uh, of the, of the patient as well. So now communication. So remember, this was one of the key elements that we talked about when it came to a complex adaptive system. Um, if those cells, sorry, in a complex adaptive system, if you can't communicate, think of an ant colony and all the individual ants running around. If you were to stop them from communicating, you'd probably get a collapse of that colony. Because one of the things the ants do is when they go out foraging, they leave a little pheromone trail, and when they find some food, they come back, they reinforce that pheromone trail, the next ant looks for this pheromone trail, and it follows that trail. So that's a form of communication. If you were to block that communication, ants would just be randomly out looking for food, as opposed to purposely going to where there's food that they can bring back to the colony. So for this, we looked at tumor cells and say, well, is there a way that tumor cells can communicate instantaneously with one another? And what we found there is. And so there's a thing called gap junctions. And basically what they are, this is one cell and the outside of a cell, this is another cell, is there's these things called gap junctions where these tumor cells actually hook right up to one another. They form basically just kind of like, a, like a, a tunnel and allows things to go back and forth and allows things to go back and forth really quickly. 
And so I won't go through all the sort of things we did to show that that was the case, but basically once we had proven that there was this communication going on, there's a whole bunch of drugs that are FDA approved for other indications um, that are gap junction inhibitors, and it stops them from communicating. So these drugs are things like um, carboxanol, uh, mef uh, mefloroquine, and heptanol. And so the second, the first one is a Um, a gastric drug for ulcers. The second one is a malaria drug, and the last one is actually used for essential tremors, and it's actually an alcohol. So we looked at these, we found that they actually do inhibit gap junction um, communication between cells. And then the next question was, well, what happens when we have our tumor cells in a tissue culture dish, and we treat them with these gap junction inhibitors? Well, you can see the controls here in black, how, you know, how they're expanding. And the ones that are getting chemotherapy, they actually don't care about the chemotherapy. This is a chemotherapy-resistant cell line. But when we treat them with the gap junction inhibitors, they slow down their proliferation. And when we do chemotherapy and the gap junction inhibitors, it slows it down even more. So it was really interesting when we got this data. This suggested that you block the communication. You can take cells that are insensitive to chemotherapy, and you can make them sensitive to the chemotherapy. Um, go for that. And so then next we move to an animal model. So we did what we call a sub-Q model, put a tumor in the side of the animal, it's really easy to measure it, and you treat them with various gap junction inhibitors. And again, we see the same basic general effect. If we look at tumor volume, when we treat them with the gap junction inhibitor, it reduces tumor progression, and we do chemo and gap junction inhibitor together, it reduces it even more. And we see the same thing when we put these cells in the brain as well and basically the animals end up living longer than the animals that are just treated, um, or sorry, the animals that are not treated. So the bottom line to this then is that, oh, and sorry, and this is demonstrating that in the TMZ-treated animals, again, if you give the TMZ or the chemotherapy together with the gap junction inhibitor, is you get a further enhancement in lifespan of the animal, so the tumor progression is again further slowed down. So when it comes to this communication in cells, if you block the communication, you seem to be able to stop that population or slow down its ability to adapt. And so the last thing I want to tell you about is what project we call Death by a Thousand Cuts. And You know, we're sitting around brainstorming about kind of what we want to do, and we're thinking of things like this, is that we want to use non-toxic treatments that can be stacked and used in combination with conventional treatments. In choosing our non-toxic treatments, we want there to be things that already have some evidence of safety and some evidence of efficacy. And the reason we wanted to do this was we wanted to move in clinical testing phase as quickly as possible. And the reason is, is that our preclinical models are informative but not predictive. So our preclinical models tell us something about the disease we're studying, but they actually don't predict what will happen in a person. The only way you're going to know that it's going to work in a person, you just have to do it in a person. So we didn't want to work in the lab for five to ten years in our animal models and then go test it in a human. We wanted to work in the lab for a few years in our animal models and go test in people as quickly as possible. And we also wanted a treatment that was very practical and would have a high compliance and was also going to be affordable. And, you know, if you look at the cost of some of the new cancer drugs coming out, we're talking $10,000 a month, hundreds of thousands of dollars per course of treatment, and we're talking um, increasing life expectancy by weeks or months. We're not talking cures here, we're talking weeks or months. It, I, personally, I think it's just gotten out of control. So this got us thinking about natural products. And so one... There's about 70 natural products in the literature that have an anti-cancer effect, way too many to study. So we set an inclusion-exclusion criteria to narrow it down to something that we can manage ourselves. And so the first thing we said is there had to be a substantial body of evidence in the literature that that natural product um, had some efficacy. So there had to be dozens to hundreds of research papers. Second, there had to be evidence of safety. Um, and at doses that we knew worked at efficacy. So we had to, basically, we couldn't look for safety at a dose of 10, but efficacy was at 100, because that doesn't match up. So that was our second criteria when we went through the literature. Next, we wanted there to be data in the literature that this was safe in humans, because we didn't want to, again, work in the lab, work on an animal, go do our phase one safety trial in a human, and bomb, because there's some just unknown effect that 
pops out of something that makes it unsafe. So we wanted all this stuff to be in the literature. And the last thing was, which was the toughest thing to overcome, so it had to be a company that was reliable, that gave batch to batch the same, and that gave us with a, with a certificate of analysis, and we, they could show us the data for their past two to three years that we knew every batch was the same, so they could continue to supply it, because we didn't want to do our rodent studies with this batch, and then we go to our human studies, and just because of the way they process or develop that natural product, that batch is totally different. That was the hardest thing for us to overcome. So basically what happened, and there had to be known mechanisms, because uh, you know, we knew we were probably going to fail the first time we do this, and, but if we knew some mechanisms, we could modify it to make it better over time. And so what we came up with is we came up with this combination of three natural products, which we call epidiferfane, or EDP for short. And basically, it is a, a catechine from green tea. It's curcumin that comes from turmeric. And it's broccoli sprout powder. So the active compound is called sulfurophane. You get sulfurophane in crucifix vegetables, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. The highest concentration is in broccoli sprouts. You know the alfalfa sprouts you buy at the grocery store? You can buy broccoli sprouts. If you were to eat one of those containers of broccoli sprouts, you get a therapeutic dose of sulfurophane. So we actually, literally, from a, Calif from a company in California, we get freeze-dried broccoli sprouts. We mix the three of these together. We call it epidiferphane. But the other thing we did is we also mixed this with what is known as the ketogenic diet. And I won't go too much into this, but the ketogenic diet was a diet that was developed in the 1920s to treat children with epilepsy. It's basically a very high-fat diet, very low in carbohydrates. Um, the, the diet is terrible to take because it's like 90% fat, 3% carbs, 7% protein, really hard to sustain and stay on the diet. But there's a growing body of literature, and there's probably been several talks here about the ketogenic diet, showing efficacy in treating high-grade gliomas and, another, uh, and other types of cancers as well. So this is kind of what the typical ketogenic meal looks like. Can you, you know, we all have meals like this, but can you imagine this three squares a day, day in and day out? It's really tough to do. People that do this, I think, are quite remarkable. So, there was a student in the lab, Regina, that wanted to work on this, but she wanted to make it, the diet a little easier to take, and so she developed what she called the modified ketogenic diet, or the supplemental high-fat, low-carb diet. And in essence, what she did is she took, you know, if this is sort of the, the normal diet composition of the, of the American diet, that's the ketogenic diet, she made it look like this. So it's about 60% fat, maybe about 10 to 20 percent carbohydrates, and the rest being protein. And so it's kind of like an Atkins diet, basically. So it's something that's doable, you've got to pay attention, it's a little bit tough, but it's definitely doable. And so it's low carb, and she supplements it with a fat, a, a specific type of fat called a medium-chain triglyceride. And what happens when you're on a ketogenic diet is you get at least two physiological features. One, glucose levels come down. Two, ketone levels go up. And so when she did the Atkins-like diet, supplementing with this medium-chain triglyceride, she saw the same thing. So she would see the glucose levels come down in her modified ketogenic diet, same as the um, classic ketogenic diet, and she would see the ketone levels go up in the same way that it did with the classic ketogenic diet. And then importantly, she tested it in an animal model. And so this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. That's the number of surviving animals. This is time. You can see that the animals that are, not, are just on a normal diet, they die relatively quickly. But the animals on the ketogenic diet and the modified ketogenic diet um, survive longer and survive about the same time. So Regina's diet had the same anti-cancer effect as the classic ketogenic diet, but in theory, should be easier um, to implement into a patient population. So when we add the epidiferphane, together with this modified ketogenic diet, we call it Cancerna, just to give it a label so I don't have to explain all the bits and pieces. So is it, is it safe? Well, well, if we look at body weight of the animals, yeah, it appears to be safe. These animals gain weight like control animals. They appear to be healthy. So they're not losing weight. We can look at things like organ health, um, all completely normal, so there's no abnormal liver enzymes, kidney enzymes, pancreatic enzymes. We can look at white blood cells. Are the white blood cells normal? Are they affected? Like chemotherapy tends to reduce this population. The modified ketogen, sorry, the cancerna doesn't affect the white blood cell population at all. So based on body weight, based on a complete blood count and 
critical organ enzyme levels um, the diet's safe to take, again, in a rodent. Um, again, so it's just the model that we use. So first thing, what about epidiferphane? What if you just give animals the epidiferphane? Does it make a difference? And the answer is yes, it does. So animals live longer if they're just on the epidiferphane. So the epidiferphane in and of itself has a significant anti-cancer effect. I've already showed you this, doing the, comparing the ketogenic diet and the modified ketogenic diet. And when we add the two together, create the cancerna, what we do is we get basically a doubling of the survival effect when we do the two together. So the animals are living longer, tumors are progressing slower. Now, when we developed this, um, we never intended this to be a standalone treatment, but to always be a treatment that would be used together with standard of care. And so what this is showing is this is looking at tumor progression, and you can see the progression of the untreated tumor, the TMZ is in the yellow, so in this case, the TMZ-treated tumor, the chemotherapy-treated tumor, is slowing down its progression. And when we do the Cancerna, it looks the same as the standard of care chemotherapy, but when we do the two together, we get an even further reduction in tumor progression. And one thing that's really important for the brain tumors is that these brain tumors, these high-grade gliomas, about 50% of patients will be resistant to the chemotherapy up front and the other 50% of patients will develop resistance within the first 6 to 12 months of treatment. So basically, that chemotherapy, it doesn't work very well. So the question we asked is, in the tumors that are resistant, so here's the tumor progression, there's the control, this green is the, is the um, TMZ, or the chemotherapy-treated animals. These tumors don't care that they're getting chemotherapy at all. They're just blowing, they're just going for it. But when we give the Cancerna, it actually slows down tumor progression, and interestingly, these are cells that are insensitive to chemotherapy. When we give them the Cancerna, they become sensitive because their tumor progression slows down even more. And one of the other interesting things we looked at, and we kind of stumbled across this by accident, and this was sort of as a preventative treatment. So we found that if we put animals on the Cancerna treatment, we left them on it for like a month or two, and then we would take tumor cells, a million tumor cells, inject them into the hip of the animal. When we do this, virtually 100% of the time, that animal forms a tumor. And the animals that had been on the Cancerna for a month and continued to stay on the Cancerna after we injected the tumor cells, only four out of the ten animals actually developed a tumor. And we left those animals go for six months. They never developed a tumor. So it seemed to have some sort of effect in stopping that tumor initiation. And this wasn't implanting one tumor cell. This was implanting a million tumor cells into these animals. And the animals that did, those four out of ten animals that did develop a tumor, their tumor progression was significantly, well, it was basically it was about three times slower than the animals that um, did not have the, um, the cancer in a treatment. We've looked at other tumors as well. So we've looked at colon tumors, and again, we see the same survival increase. We've looked at um, lung tumors, again, the same survival increase. And we've looked at breast tumors, and again, we've seen the survival increase. And we actually just finished a study. Um, we've gotten a grant from the Florida Breast Cancer Foundation several years ago. We looked at different subtypes of breast cancer tumors derived from patients, gave them the Cancerna treatment, and we see the same basic general effect. Not in all the subtypes, interestingly. It was only in some of the subtypes that we actually saw that effect. And why that is, we don't quite know yet. And so, you know, what are the mechanisms? So I don't really want to go too much into these mechanisms, but rather just give you a little bit of a hint, because part of this is actually important, because this comes back to the ecology stuff that we were talking about earlier. And so we think the mechanism is what we call horizontal and vertical inhibition. And basically, horizontal inhibition means that we need to target multiple pathways, not target one pathway, but target maybe two pathways or ten pathways at the same time. And we also believe it's doing what is called vertical inhibition. And so pathways, for instance, will have nodes in it where this will affect this, affect this, affect this, and maybe it's here that gives it the final outcome. And what will happen in tumor cells is if you block this, part of the pathway, is it will find a way around that pathway. And it will just, you know, it's just like taking a side road when there's a detour. So what we do know is that our treatment actually targets multiple pathways, uh, or sorry, multiple nodes along that single pathway. So it's kind of like saying, look, I put up a roadblock here. You may want to go around and go this way, but I put up a roadblock here and a roadblock here. 
And again, the part we can't forget about is also we've also used in the ketogenic diet, which I, we believe targets cancers at a metabolic level. Um, sort of level, and you know, tumor cells blow through glucose like crazy. It's the basis of PET scans. By lowering the glucose and by increasing the ketones, we believe that in and of itself has an anti-cancer effect. And you know, um, Dr. Diagostino here has done you know some of the groundbreaking work, and his colleague um, Thomas Seifried, who gave a talk here maybe a year or two ago, um, who's you know clearly the leader in this field, has demonstrated that the ketogenic diet in and of itself. Is a viable cancer treatment, particularly for high-grade gliomas. So, all of this is actually following the ecological principles I've been talking about, or I talked about at the very beginning of the lecture. And so, for instance, this management by moderation. Well, that's in the idea of using low doses and reducing the selection pressure. So, you know, these are natural products. We're using these at doses that you could obtain from drinking maybe 15 cups of green tea in a day, from Eating one or two of those broccoli sprouts powder,、um, the turmeric's a little bit different because turmeric has really low bioavailability, or the curcumin. So we actually have to use a special form of curcumin that has high bioavailability. So it would be hard to consume enough Indian meals or enough、uh, turmeric、um, to, to get this effect. But basically, you know, we're putting a, a low selection pressure. We're using low doses, but we're targeting multiple pathways, right? Not targeting one pathway strongly, targeting a whole bunch of them. Management by saturation, by targeting multiple pathways, when that tumor cell is trying to escape, trying to get around whatever that selection pressure is, whatever pathway I shut off,、um, it's going to another one. But because we're targeting literally a dozen different pathways, it's hitting those other pathways. It's just making it harder for that tumor cell to adapt, and again, slowing down its proliferation. And again, management by multiple attacks. This is having several independent stressors, not one. Large stressor, and one of the reasons this is so critical is that you know a, a fundamental tenet of evolutionary biology is the stronger selection pressure you put on a population, the quicker that population will evolve. So it's interesting. There was a paper that came out in PNAS、um, a few months ago. And they looked at a bacteria from it was looking at the fossilized bacteria from like two billion years ago, and they compared something like one from like three billion years ago, two billion years ago, and compared it to the same bacteria today. That bacteria did not evolve for over two billion years at all, but the reason was it was so far down, buried so far down, and this was living in these very sulfur-like environments that its environment never changed. So, because there was no environmental change, no selection pressure put on it, it didn't adapt. And so, that's an extreme. Take the other extreme is chemotherapy, where you're giving a very toxic compound and you're forcing that population to adapt as quickly as it can adapt. So, there needs to be some middle ground here, where we can give things to put a small selection pressure on the population, being able to try to control it, but not force it to adapt quicker. And so. You know, we know the epidiphosphane targets multiple pathways. We know the modified ketogenic diet and the ketogenic diet targets a number of the key metabolism aspects of tumors, and, and targets a number of tumor drivers as well. And again, not going to go through all of these, but as an example, you know, here's a list of you know seven different key drivers of tumor cell proliferation. And don't worry about the acronyms, but you know. This one was reduced by 50 percent. That's reduced by 90 percent. This again, when we treat it with Cancerna, this is reduced by 70 percent, by 90 percent, by 60 percent. That's reduced. It's actually want, you want it to be increased that that one, and this one is reduced by 50 percent. So we know that we're not just targeting. You're not taking one single drug targeting one mechanism. We're taking one drug that literally targets.、Um, Multiple mechanisms and very likely dozens of different mechanisms, and it all comes back to this horizontal and vertical inhibition. So, in summary, the adaptive therapy really is a way to delay resistance. The communication. This is really one of the key fundamental principles of complex adaptive systems, and tumor cells are a complex adaptive system. And the death by a thousand cuts is really just implementing insecticide-resistant management, or implying the、um, the integrative pest management principles into cancer biology. And so, I'd like to thank people that have been involved with this.、Um, Dr. Lloyd Galroy was a postdoc in my lab in Australia. 
He was a postdoc in my lab in Gaines in, at the University of Florida, and he's now an assistant professor in the department, and he was really key to you know, running a large number of these experiments. Um, Regina, I mentioned, who developed the modified ketogenic diet, um, and of course, Madden Oli, who is my ecology guru, and whenever we are embarking on a new set of experiments, I always go to Madden and I say, look, here's the roadblock we're at. Should I go left or should I go right? What would you as an ecologist do? And he tells me what the ecology field would do, and that's what we do. So we're basically trying to be an ecologist in the oncology world. And Dennis Steinler, who's also a, a very good collaborator, um, and who used to be the institute director at the, at the Institute of who's now at, the, at Tufts University um, at a nutrition institute. And these are all the people, these are some of the people that have been involved. My lab's had over a hundred undergraduates in its lab in the last sef, six, seven years. And they're the, really the ones that, you know, they come in, they volunteer, they work for free, they give up their weekends, they give up their social lives, even some of them even give up their jobs so that they can come to the lab and do it. And so that's the group that's really been responsible for generating all the data. So thank you very much. Um, any questions? Oh. I'm curious as to why there was no discussion of radiology treatment throughout this. It was focused strictly on chemotherapy versus adaptive therapy. So that's basically what we've been attacking is the chemotherapy side. So the radiology doesn't fit well into the ecology model. And, you know, when you look at one of the things that has had a significant impact in cancer outcomes, um, it has actually been radiation. But when you look at where most of the research work is, it's not in radiation. Most of the research work actually is in the chemotherapy. And the message that we're wanting to send here is that we can't be doing the same thing again and again in the chemotherapy world. We need to start looking at this problem in a slightly different way. But um, I think it's a good point, and radiation is clearly a, cor a cornerstone of many cancer treatments, and um, it does demonstrate more efficacy than the chemotherapy. But yet, you know, that's not where we're spending our time and our energy, the community as a whole. How has this been met by your colleagues who are in the more traditional therapeutic fields in, in your department, for example? Um, my department's been incredibly supportive. However, overall, um, it's been cool. So, or the response has been cool, right? Not cool in a good way. <laughs> so, for, for instance, you know, we have all this, um, you know, anti-cancer data. You know, we, we've done over a thousand animals um, so it's not, you know, this is not a study of 10 animals where we saw this. We've done over 1,000 animals. Go to the clinical colleagues, show them the data, and say, hey, would you try this in some of your patients? And, and we go to the people that like us, that trust us, even ones we collaborate and have grants together with. And the oncologists, they're just, you know, they don't say no, but they don't say yes. And the reason is, is there's this general thought in the oncology, in particular the neuro-oncology community, is that I have these really nasty drugs and I can't treat cancer very well. Brent, what are you going to do with that you know, vitamin stuff you do, right? How, how is that going to work? And, you know, I showed you the adaptive therapy stuff. Um, you know, again, we've, you know, we've done seven rounds of adaptive therapy, and it's worked in all sort of the little, slight little deviations that we've done. Again, go to, the, to my neuro-oncology colleague and say, hey, I don't want you to test a new drug on anyone. I just want you to change how you deliver it. Now, these patients, when you get diagnosed with this high-grade glioma, you're going to die of that high-grade glioma. And, you know, at six months, 50% of you are going to be completely resistant. But you know what? They still treat those patients because they don't know which 50%, right? And so we say, look, would you adapt this? Like, try this? And, they, and you know, they say, hey, I think it's really neat, Brent. It's such cool stuff. But they won't do it. And the reason is, and I can remember this one oncologist telling me this, he says, you know what? If I have a drug that's working and my tumor's shrinking, I'm going for it. As a matter of fact, I may even increase the dosage if I can. And I say, but the ecology world, from literally thousands of studies, have shown that is the worst thing to do. And he says, I, I, I'm just going to do it. 
And so it's been very difficult to move into the clinical testing phase. And you know what? It's when someone has an idea in their mind, trying to get it out of their mind, it's really difficult to do. We have time for one more question, and we have one at the back. I appreciate what you're doing, and thank you so much, because I study whole food, plant-based diets. But I'm curious to find out, in the Cancerna diet, in the ketogenic combination, are you, has anyone tested 100% organic versus non-organic and pesticide treated as far as, has there been any differentiation or attempt to do that? So as far as I know, um, no, no one has tried that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think there is evidence out there mm -hmm. that um, taking in pesticides, these unnatural compounds, mm -hmm. may be able to increase the incidence of cancer. Yes. But there's very little evidence that once you have cancer, that being on an organic or non-organic diet makes any difference in the progression of that cancer. And you're really talking about two different things when it comes to that. But I, you know, Dominic's probably the guy to answer because he knows more about the ketogenic diet than anyone on the planet, but I don't believe anyone has done that study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let's thank our speaker.